So those of you, hopefully most of you were here yesterday and had an opportunity to see the um, Hemp History Week presentation and uh, the short video that was put together featuring Alex. And, uh, you know, um, Alex Whiteplume has been, uh, has been uh, fighting for the good fight for hemp now for close to 20 years and, uh, and has gone through a, 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 lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of completely ridiculous and, uh, uh, you know, bureaucratic nightmares dealing with the DEA coming to his property, uh, you know, invading their sovereign territory and, and stealing his crop. And I, I couldn't be happier to have Alex here today. I feel like, uh, you know, we're, um, we're getting really close to, to realize the original vision that Alex had for him to be able to plant the crop and create economic opportunity on the reservation. And so I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to introduce Alex. And uh, we also have Michael Reif here. Michael works with the firm Robbins Kaplan in North Dakota, and they were very instrumental in uh, getting uh, the injunction that was put on the, onto, onto Alex by the federal government to prohibit him and his family from being able to grow hemp. And uh, we're able to get that overturned this year by a federal judge. You can clap. <laughs> that was, <laughs> yeah. So we, we removed the biggest barrier, and, and I think Alex is going to talk more about where we're at and what needs to happen and where, what his plans are. But uh, we're also very excited to have uh, Marcus Grignan here. And Marcus is with uh, Hempstead Project Heart, which is a great organization that was started by John Trudell, a Native American activist. And uh, uh, I think Lee here in the crowd is also with Hempstead Project Heart. And there's uh, someone else as well, maybe. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, yes. Uh, and so I'm excited to have them here and have Marcus here. And so may, some of you may have heard that the, uh, the Menominee tribe have actually had a raid uh, in uh, this year and uh, that the DEA came in and stole their crop and they had been, you know, cooperating with the federal government. They had to advise them and, and so this is another outrageous, uh, you know, violation of so tri tribal sovereignty. So we're going to talk about that as well. And then we got Patrick Goggin here and Patrick's been working as an attorney in the hemp industry for about two decades now and has done some great work uh, with, with our organization as well with a lot of other folks. So he's going to moderate the panel. Patrick, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you and take it away. All right. Thanks, Eric. Um, I'm really honored to be here moderating this panel. I've been practicing for uh, law for 20 years. Uh, my, one of my intros, actually, uh, into the Hemp Industries Association, was my first HIA uh, conference was on the Pine Ridge Reservation. With Alex Whiteplume and his family hosted us. Um, <laughs> I actually, I actually did a mediation in one of their teepees there, so it was really powerful, good medicine. Um, I'd also like to introduce Michael. Um, did, did, did Eric actually get to you? Yes. Okay, we, all right. We're good. We're, we're, all, we're, we're all good. Okay. Um, I'm just going to, since we have a limited amount of time, I'm really just going to throw the questions out and really lead it, and we'll try to keep some time at the end. If we don't get to, uh, time at the end for questions and answers, we'll go out in the hall, but we'll, we'll try to hold on with, uh, keep five minutes extra. So, Alex, how did your family, you and your family, get interested in hemp farming? Uh, before I answer that, I hope nobody makes fun of us because there's four of us sitting up here and we make the Mount Rushmore formation, so. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in my family, uh, half of our children go to college, and I have a lot of children that are really educated. And I wanted to get into farming because the Lakotas were warrior societies. And as you know, what we did to Custer at the Little Bighorn, and we've been getting punished ever since. But some of my children were researching, I was going to plant alfalfa, because we research corn and they, they do about 50% damage to the earth, so we didn't want to do corn. So we done a farm plan and at, in 19, um, 98 was the first time I planted hemp, and uh, it was a family decision. It wasn't my decision, but I'm the elder male in the family, so um, I go along with consensus of the family. So uh, we researched hemp, and we, uh, in those days, the farm plan, we, it was $197 an acre yield versus $45 an acre for alfalfa, so it was hands down that we were going to go with hemp. All right. Now, uh, Marcus, can you, can you tell us a little bit more about Hempstead Project Heart and how you got involved? Um, sure, yeah. Uh, 
I um, got involved with Hempstead Project Heart. Um, I was working on the uh, hemp farm on the Miami Indian Reservation last summer, and uh, right around the time of August, I believe, we were finding out that the feds were going to come in and take our crop. And so, uh, kind of in my mind, it kind of played out of like what would happen. Same thing would happen in South Dakota with Alex Whiteland. The same was going to happen here in Menominee. So I kind of did something about it, and I wrote a letter to John Trudell's organization, Hempstead Project Heart, asked him for help, um, and basically kind of painted the picture of what my vision was, and it's to build a green economy in Indian country using hemp, hemp as a tool. And um, so I wrote that letter to him, and he answered back, and he basically offered his full support with the organization. This is around the time when he was starting to get uh, a lot more sick and ill, and then at one point, um, he was in hospice, so uh, I asked to meet him, and uh, he honored that, and so I flew out to California to meet him, and he offered me a position within Hempstead Project Heart to basically carry the torch forward for him because, uh, you know, he wasn't going to be here long enough, and he wanted a young Native person to do it, and so he asked me to do that, so. Yeah. It If, if you've never heard John Trudell speak, I highly recommend finding some video. He's one of the more uh, motivating, inspirational characters. He's one of my heroes. Um, Michael, can you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in American Indian law? Yeah, um, so my introduction actually goes back to the year after I graduated college. Um, I Spent a year um, in Ashland, Montana, right on the edge of the Northern Cheyenne Reservation as part of the Jesuit Volunteer Corps. And so I worked at the St. LeBray School and I worked uh, tutoring um, kids that came from the Crow Reservation uh, and went to school, uh, went to high school and grade school uh, in, in and around Ashland. And so um, basically lived on the res and got a chance to learn a lot about culture and um, be an outsider uh, for a year, um, but learned so much. and. Um, so I, I went to law school after that, took American Indian law as a course, and then kind of sat on that for a while um, until um, about a year and a half ago, the former U.S. attorneys from North and South Dakota, uh, Tim Purden and Brennan Johnson, who did a lot of work in Indian country while at the U.S. attorney's office, joined my firm in Minneapolis, and um, we had an opportunity to get involved in some American Indian law cases, starting with Alex's uh, battle. And um, from there, we've had a chance to work with Menominee um, and to work um, across a range of sort of industries and interests within uh, American Indian law. That's great. Okay, so we're now gonna kind of lead into uh, the background and what's led up to these two cases. So, um, Alex, can you describe DEA's harassment that led to your injunction and what ultimately led to seeking the lifting of the injunction? Well, to start off with, I, um, um, when we first, when, well, when I, when I grew up, I went to Berlin, Germany. I served five years in the military, and I was behind the Iron Curtain in Berlin, and I got to see many cultures. And there's five ingredients to be a sovereign nation. One is you have to have a language. Two, you have to have a police force. Three, you have to have a government. Four, you have to have land. And five, you have to have some form of governance. So when I came back from Berlin in 1978, the Oglalas, we have all that. And one of the things that set, sets us apart is the Oglala Sioux tribe, Lakota, where I come from, we've only had 200 years of contact. And, and the ones that were 500 years of contact, 400 years, 300 years, they're no more. They were totally run over and, and, and wiped out through disease and uh, lying and murder and you know, warfare. So I came home and I said, well, you know, we got to be a sovereign nation. We've got to act our part. And then I ran into the uh, nightmare of the bureaucracy of the federal government because I'm not a sovereign person. What I am is I'm a code of federal regulation, Title 25, called Indians. And every part of my life is regulated by the United States government. And the United States government are uh, liars, thieves. They're, they're not good for anybody, especially towards us. So every part of my life is regulated. So I, I realized that, and then... Uh, when my children and my nieces and nephews all decided to grow hemp, uh, we said, well, we are really sovereign. And uh, so we went for it. We started growing hemp. 
And when we were growing hemp, we weren't worried about the feds coming in to uh, eradicate or arrest us. Our main fear was, are we going to do the harvest ceremonies right? Are we going to do the proper songs the way my great-grandpas used to? So that was our biggest nightmare. And we finally got the harvest rituals back again. And uh, after 200 years of contact of boarding schools and our language being beaten out of us, and, and some of the Lakotas, my grandpas, are all still speak Lakota. And today, if you go to any reservation, the poorest people on any reservation are usually the ones that maintain their language and their culture. They didn't dive into the melting pot to become the tomato in that melting pot, I guess. So uh, that's what led up to us growing industrial hemp. And I invited the FBI, the U.S. Attorney, I invited uh, President Clinton, I invited everybody, the BIA superintendent, the chiefs of police, and on Pine Ridge Reservation, if a state police comes on a reservation, we'll arrest them for trespassing. <laughs> so the, uh, the Pine Ridge is one of the only few reservations that has that status. So we, uh, we didn't expect them to come and attack us, because if you read the treaty, Article 1 says we're going to turn bad man over to the FBI. And in 1890 was when the first federal law started. But it was because of the treaty, Article 1, that we're going to turn bad man over to them. That's when federal Indian law started. They call it the Seven Major Crimes Act. And that, that Seven Major Crimes Act that the feds use today against you was actually Indian law towards Indians, not you guys. But you guys all been, like, sleeping, you know, your eyes are sleeping, you didn't realize that. So today the federal law they use against you is the Indian law and uh, there's a lot of racism. I wish the white people would get mad and raise hell, say, hey, I don't want this federal law on me. That, that's towards the Indians, but that hasn't happened. But uh, we didn't want the DEA to come in. They abrogated the treaty. But then we realized that the DEA are just cops, basic cops. They don't know nothing about treaty abrogation law. So where do we go from this when the low man on the totem pole violates a federal law, a treaty law? So uh, we didn't expect the DEA to come in. And uh, that first year, in 2000, that's when my plants grew. They were 16, 20 foot tall, big as my thumb. Beautiful plants. And we, uh, we were ready for the harvest when they came in. It was 35 agents came in. And uh, the hemp, they're strong too. They're just like us, they're living. And they had a strategy. So what they did was they allowed stinging nettles to grow amongst them. So when the feds came in to uh, cut the hemp down, they all got rash, you know? <laughs> so I said, right on the hemp, or like Lakota, they're fighting. <laughs> But we didn't expect them to come in like they did. We expected them to be honorable and respect our treaty. So, but ultimately they uh, came in three times, correct? Yeah. And, and got an, uh, eventually got an injunction. This was in 2002. Yeah. Um, so 14 some odd years transpired, Michael. What, what was it that led to uh, the seeking of the lifting of the injunction and in answering that, can you describe to us uh, the Wilkinson memo? Yeah, so some of you in the room may be familiar with um, the Cole Memorandum, and then the Wilkinson Memorandum is, uh, applies the Cole Factors to Indian country. And so what the Cole Factors uh, recognize, this was a deputy uh, U.S. Attorney General, uh, a step or two down from Eric Holder at the time, and this was about 2013. So you've got um, Colorado, you've got some other states that were legalizing marijuana, and so the uh, Department of Justice realized that there needed to be some response to states moving forward um, with uh, legalization and, and what they were going to do because it was still, I mean, it still is right now scheduled as uh, or categorized as a Schedule One drug under the Controlled Substances Act. And so what the Cole Memorandum did um, was say there are eight factors that we're going to look at to try to figure out whether it's worth using Department of Justice resources, which are scarce, in going after people for um, growing and uh, selling marijuana. Um, and so um, based on factors, things like um, preventing distribution of marijuana to minors, um, preventing revenue from the sale of marijuana to, uh, from getting into criminal inter enterprises or gangs, um, being mindful of um, marijuana crossing over from states uh, in which it's legal to states in which it's not, um, being sure that the sale of marijuana isn't related to trafficking of other drugs, um, factors like that. So that, that's maybe four or five of them. There are a few more. 
Um, so that, those are the cold factors. And so um, what the Wilkinson memorandum did was say, all right, let's take those which apply to all the states and let's make sure that they specifically apply to Indian country. That was in 2014. And so when Tim Purden left the Department of Justice in North Dakota and came to my firm, one of the things he had worked on a hemp case, uh, had worked with Eric in Vote Hemp um, in, in trying to uh, represent some hemp farmers in North Dakota about 10 years ago. Um, and he knew of Alex and knew of Alex's story and said, um, let's see what we can do. Um, we know some people in the Department of Justice. You've got this change in the law. Uh, there was also the, the 2014 Farm Bill, um, which uh, had just gone into uh, effect in early 2015. Um, and so uh, right around the time when Tim was joining the firm. And so there was this confluence of factors um, that we knew was going on at the time. And we said, well, let's see what we can do to pay it forward a little bit and try to seek some justice for Alex and see what we can do to right this wrong. Uh, Alex was the only person in America that had an injunction uh, singling him out from keeping him from growing industrial hemp, uh, which is staggering. And so, um, but yeah. we, we're, 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 let's hold on to that thought. You bet. We don't want to get into, uh, we don't want to spill the beans just yet. Yeah. Okay. No, no, so, fair enough. So it was, it was that combination of things um, that led us to try to reach out. And so um, with the help of Vote Hemp and others, we tried to work back channels with, uh, with uh, the Department of Justice in South Dakota to see if we could do it without um, actually going to court. They wouldn't agree, and so that's why we filed a lawsuit to, try to ask the judge to reconsider that injunction. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, Marcus? And you can use this uh, microphone. Um, how did the Menominee tribe get involved in hemp and what went awry uh, with the federal government? <clears throat> well, um, around the time, just before uh, the Wilkinson memo and the Cole memorando were basically um, applicable to Indian country, the Menominees were in a uh, long struggle to get a casino in the state of Wisconsin on some of our old homelands. And so we were battling with other tribes. And we actually brought the Seminole in, we were gonna have a hard rock casino there. And basically the, the, um, the governor was saying like, oh well all tribes have to approve of it and so forth. And so basically it was a long fought battle. At one point uh, there were a few Menominees who walked from our reservation all the way to the, st um, the capital in Madison during the middle of winter. And so that was about like, I don't know, 800 miles or, no I, I take that back, it's not that long. It's about 300 I'd say. And so they walked all the way just to prove a point like we need this to you know, basically pull us out of poverty and basically the governor said no. And so after that my uh, tribal leaders kind of went back to the drawing board and um, once they found out about the coal memorandum they were like well let's try out hemp. So from March up until April the Menominees were contacting the Fed saying we'd like to get involved with hemp. What do we need to do to um, basically make it legit? And uh, as far as I know, and from what I read in the emails, we never really got a, a response back. And so we put together uh, an ordinance to legalize uh, hemp for industrial use, um, and as well as for research purposes, in conjunction with our tribal college, which is the College of Menominee Nation, a land grant college, which was authorized by the Morrell Act of 1862 to basically create institutions that um, were focused on agriculture and mechanic arts. So it was a perfect lineup for where, what we're doing, what we're trying to accomplish. And so uh, we passed that in May, and the tribe um, started figuring out where to go with it. And I think one of our tribal members approached them and said, well, let's grow hemp. I know these people to do it. And so that's kind of where it came about. Um, and we broke ground on July 7th and we've been working on it for a while. At that point, towards the end of July, we had the feds come in and they toured the area where we, where we were growing it. And uh, I wasn't present at the time, but from what I hear from our tribal leaders that it got pretty heated, but they didn't take the crop. They saw the crop all right there, but they didn't take it. It's like, you can take it now if you want. If we're in violation, take it now, and they didn't. So it went on for a few months and then I was doing some agricultural work. Um, so. With me, I was brought on as an agricultural researcher um, through my tribe. I did a lot of agricultural work with bison manure, um, container gardening, things like that. So they knew who I was and what I was all about. So they asked me to come on and do agricultural work and research for them. So I did that. And um, 
I remember it was the middle of August. I just came out of the trailer. I had all my gear, like I'm like ready to go, you know, write down stuff, take pictures of all these different hemp plants and, you know, conduct my research. And as I walk out, I see a DEA agent right there, like snapping pictures. And, you know, he's armed and he's sitting there and he looks at me, but I think he didn't think I was gonna be there. Like he didn't think anyone was gonna be there. He kind of got startled and I got startled. I'm all like, whoa. And like, I looked at he was armed. And I'm like, all right, well, middle of, middle of the reservation, nobody around. like for miles, so I'm just gonna play it cool and just chill out. And so I walk past him, he walks past me, he flashes his badge, and I'm like, whatever, I'm just gonna tell my tribal leaders that he was here. And so I snap a picture of him before he leaves, and then I send that to them, I tell them that I think we had a federal agent on our grounds, and uh, they checked with our tribal police, they didn't have an escort, because you have to have an escort to come on our reservation. Uh, the chief of police wasn't present, it was just that federal agent, and um, they had no warrant, nothing. So. And it went by like that. There was um, some harsh words. And basically I said I would go on record with the DA saying that you had an agent on our lands that did not, have, did not uh, furnish a warrant for me. And basically you're in violation of treaty rights and tribal law. And so um, they stepped back a little bit. And then right around the time of harvest, they came in and um, they wanted to test the crop. And so we we're like, Go right ahead, it's totally cool. They tested it, tested negative, they took some samples, and um, they raided us three or four days later. I was coming into work down the hill, you know, and uh, I see all those agents just coming in and taking everything, and like you see the big bulldozer coming in and just taking out all that land, all that soil, like, it took everything. And it was, it was really unfortunate, and the funny thing about it is, and something I learned about this summer was that um, they said that it tested negative in the field, but because of the fact that they were traveling, it may have shifted and the equipment didn't work. So that's why they took the samples. But then, you know, once they took it to the lab and it tested positive, they raided us, and then the tribal leaders were like, well, let's see the results. We never got the results. It was never shown. And all those 30,000 plants were all full of seeds, good seeds too. I saw them, I saw them, I looked at them. So, you know, that's kind of how it was. And then we went to court with them and we lost and we're just keeping on moving forward. All right, big breath. Michael, so what happened in Alex's case when you sought to lift the injunction? And can you explain why there's a different result in Alex's case in the Menominee case. Yeah. So <clears throat> my firm was involved on both cases. I personally was involved on both cases. So as happy as we were uh, for Alex and the result there, uh, we were equally disappointed and continued to be disheartened by what happened in Menominee, especially because, as Marcus pointed out, they were doing everything right. Um, so there are a couple differences between the cases. Um, in Alex's case, we were seeking a very sort of narrow ruling from the court. We were asking the court to overturn uh, an injunction. Um, and so a standard was different. We were asking the court to reconsider based on changed circumstances in the law. And so that's part of what I previewed earlier. The judge actually recognized in the order that there had been, uh, there was a sea change in the way that the government, uh, both at a state and uh, federal level, was thinking about um, uh, industrial hemp. Um, and so that was part of what allowed um, the judge to say, um, I am not recognizing that um, Alex and his family can legally grow uh, industrial hemp, but I can recognize that this uh, injunction is outdated and can't stand anymore. Um, and so um, it was a narrow holding. And so what we were trying for in Menominee was broader. Um, we, were, we were looking for actual um, authorization for the tribe, or at least recognition that under the Farm Bill, uh, under 7606, um, the Menominee um, tribe had the same kind of rights as the state would, um, especially on tribal land where state law doesn't apply. Um, Menominee is not a public law 280 uh, applicable uh, reservation. Um, it's the only one in the state of Wisconsin, so we thought that there was a narrow enough uh, place there that it might work. Um, uh, it was working with um, an institution of higher education as recognized under the Farm Bill, so we thought that there was an opening there. Um, 
And we thought that the language of the statute was broad enough that um, you could say that, that um, the tribe was allowed to grow under there. And the judge disagreed. So there was some good and some bad, uh, ultimately far more bad in the order. Um, the judge had an opportunity to kick the case on procedural grounds, um, on an argument of standing, of some things that um, could have prevented the judge from getting to the merits. And he didn't do that. So we were heartened by that. Um, but unfortunately, um, the judge likened um, the, the Farm Bill Law 7606 to uh, the Indian Gaming Act, which is not a sort of uh, real equivalent um, in saying that you can apply state law um, and state regulation, which in Wisconsin prohibited uh, the growth of industrial hemp, um, or it did at the time, and um, you can apply that to the res even if um, they've authorized it. And so looked past any issues of sovereignty and said, just, this is just a no-go right now. So um, that's where it stands right now. Okay, so, so what we need is a legislative <clears throat> fix. We need to get uh, tribes into the legislation and, and we think that, that there's effort afoot to make that happen. Alex, can you tell us about your recent meeting with the Tribal Council to get approval to grow hemp and the path forward? Well, um, our tribe was really sophisticated. Clear back in 1998, they passed legislation to uh, separate hemp from marijuana. So that was the basis that we used to grow industrial hemp. It was legal, the tribal governing body, plus the treaty council endorsed it. So that's, that's what we started. And um, we didn't never expect the feds to do what they did. Uh, one of the things that I, uh, I, I noticed was uh, that the, um, well, I don't want to say nothing negative, I'm sorry. But what happened was with the uh, Wilkinson memo plus the uh, farm bill, which left us out, was there's no place for me to grow hemp. I fell in between all the cracks into this uh, bureaucratic nightmare. And the goal that our family set for this year is we're going to come to Americans and ask all you guys to support us. We want you to write to your congressmen, your senators, and tell them, say, hey, establish a protocol to address treaty violations. <clears throat> because when the judge overturned that restraining order, he said that the previous judge should have recognized the treaty in the first place. And then he made his decision. So we know the federal court's going to have to do that. So how do we get them to recognize it is we're going to parallel the farm bill ourselves voluntarily. Uh, our college is going to get involved and uh, do a test plot. But at the same time, we're, we're into this for cash crop. The Pine Ridge Reservation is the uh, known, in, according to census, as a poorest reservation, and I actually live in the poorest community in America. We need to get out of this, and many of us that are proud, we don't want to take federal handouts. People criticize for that, but a lot of people don't take federal handouts. So uh, that's why we're going to call upon people to support us. And you know, in America, it's easier for a foreign country to come in here and dig uranium than it is for us to grow hemp. Why is that? It's ridiculous, and so we, uh, we, we want treaties addressed, and that's what I call on all of you, if you can, if you, you know, write to your congressman, call them, and establish a protocol and correct history. We need to do that, and as long as the treaties aren't honored, there's going to be racism against us in this country. We got to resolve it, so I'm um, sorry I jumped ahead, but I, uh, it just came out, so I had to say that. <laughs> no apologies necessary. Okay, we, we've got about 10 minutes before we're going to get to a few questions, um, but I've got a few more questions. Marcus, what, what is Hempstead, Hempstead Project Hearts uh, currently doing to get tribes to grow industrial hemp as a commercial crop? So right now we're focusing on uh, Wisconsin, specifically in Menominee, where um, there wasn't a lot of education being done uh, with the tribal members. Uh, one of the things that the, I didn't say earlier was that the tribe approached me first to say, we want you to be an educator. We want you to bring tribal members to the hemp plot so that they can learn about what we're trying to do and the benefits of this and what it will bring to our community. And I was like, great. And then they line on vetoed that and then they're all like, well, we have money for agriculture research. Would you like to do that? And I'm like, sure, why not? So with that, Hempstead Project Card is looking to fill that void that was never really taken up and that is educating our people and Menominee people specifically. And that's kind of where we're starting and what we're trying to do is we want to basically shift 
um, public perception in Wisconsin to favor industrial hemp. So we're looking at legalizing hemp uh, on the state level in the next three years and um, also provide an opportunity for tribes to um, you know, use a commercial crop. And we're looking at the infrastructure. We're going to be do, uh, conducting studies, capital investment opportunities to do that. And so for the next two years, we're going to be looking at that. Um, but being here and learning about what's going on at the federal level, we may not have to do that on the state level. So we may change our strategy to where we're going to invest all of our money into building the capital investment to start processing plants on reservations, at least start with one. Because at one point, Wisconsin had nine, I should say 10, nine processing mills funded by the feds, and then one was Matt Wren's hemp company in Wisconsin. So there were 10 processing mills in Wisconsin in the first half of the 20th century before um, we basically shut everything down around 1957. So there's a rich history in Wisconsin of hemp. You know, people say that we're the, we're the miners, and it's like, no, we're the hemp growers. Like, there's, there has to be a substitute of this destructive policy that is going on in Standing Rock, that's going on back home in Wisconsin, and throughout all these other indigenous communities where they say, oh, we need these finite resources in order to create economic development. It's like, no, we need hemp. We need industrial hemp to grow our economy and start everything back up and create jobs for everybody. So when it comes to Hempstead Project Heart and what we're trying to do, you know, we're collaborating with Alex and we're going to see what we can do in Pine Ridge. Alex and I are starting to talk about what we can do in other tribal nations as well. So, you know, our focus right now is in Wisconsin as well as in South Dakota, but then we're going to start branching it out more and so we can bring together all the tribes so they can all grow. Because there's a report, if you ever get a chance to go to Washington, D.C., there's a report in Beltsville, Maryland, at the U, U, uh, USDA's National Agricultural Library, the Special Archives, and you can go in there, you can look at all kinds of stuff. They have all this information for practically every state on hemp. So one of the things was there was this thing called uh, the Economics of Hemp, and it was written by F.F. F. Elliott back in 1943. Basically, he said that three-fourths of the United States can be used to grow industrial hemp. So if you think about that and you think about our land base, you know, there's opportunity for all of us to be a part of it, natives, non-natives. And so HPH is looking to start right now to build that alliance between natives and non-natives. That's what John Trudell wanted. He wanted to make sure that we all came together and we all push forward this idea that we can all grow hemp in America and we can rebuild our country. And I think that, uh, you know, that's what we're all about. Michael, what, what can tribes and hemp consultants do to further hemp growth without running afoul of state and federal authorities and regulations? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I wish I had an easier answer to it. It really right now depends almost entirely on state law. Um, and so if you're um, working with uh, a tribe that's located within a state in which industrial hemp is legal, um, then you have an option to move forward with that. Um, as we've seen uh, in Menominee, if you're in a state in which it's not legal, um, you're pretty hamstrung. Um, and so, um, you know, I encourage um, consultants and tribe members who are interested to seek opportunities um, to work with uh, members of tribes within states. Um, I know it's happening here in Colorado. I know there are other states in which tribes are exploring it. Uh, back in Minnesota, my home state, I know that um, there are tribes looking into industrial hemp as Minnesota slowly moves forward with some pilot um, programs um, under the Farm Bill. Until we get federal legislation um, legalizing this across the board, across all 50 states, uh, it's going to be a state-by-state -state issue. Um, and until we have state legislators learning that industrial hemp uh, is a commodity crop that is good for everyone, um, and is not something that should be lumped in uh, with marijuana and all the sort of bad press that's come with that for generations. Um, it's going to continue to be a struggle. Okay, Alex, one more question. Um, what, are the biggest, what are the biggest barriers for tribes, legally or otherwise, to grow industrial hemp as a sovereign nation? And you may have already suggested some of this, but yeah. maybe elaborate a little bit more. I think the biggest obstacle that the Lakota face in South Dakota is racism, outright pure hatred 
towards us. Uh, and the reason they hate us is because we're tall, good looking, and strong, I always say. <laughs> but, but, but I don't think it's really racism. I think what it is is guilt of living on stolen land where they spill blood of our people. So I don't really consider it racism. So we want to create a, a situation where we can bring harmony back. And, and the only way to do that is they have to honor the treaties. At the rate America's destroying the earth, somebody has to stand up to protect the earth. And we all need to pass legislation where earth has a right, just the same right as humans, and like Evo Morales did. But the biggest barrier is the people themselves in South Dakota, and we want to get along. Um, we like Menominees because our warriors used to go out and steal all their women, you know. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but the biggest, uh, I guess, the obstacles is uh, when Judge Batty first created that restraining order on me for a lifetime, uh, he was a well-known Indian hater. He goes back to another governor named Janklo, and uh, they do commit crimes on reservations and actually got away with it. And I remember Judge Batty, I was standing in the, uh, I was sitting in the uh, chambers when my lawyer Bruce Ellison was sitting and he just jumped up and, and what the U.S. Attorney said was, here is Mr. White Plume standing in the middle of the marijuana field, rolling a marijuana joint, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and I had my tobacco like this and I always hold it like this so I don't spill too much, you know, because I don't want to waste. And so he, it took him about 15 minutes, that clerk of Kurtz blew it all up on the wall. And finally he said, Mr. Whiteplume, what do you have in your shirt? So I pulled out my tobacco and there was drum upside down, same way in a picture. So uh, when, when the U.S. attorney first said that, that judge just glared at me, you know. But when Bruce seen it was tobacco, then he glared at the U.S. attorney and I thought that was really a great sensation. And that picture was taken from Omaha, Nebraska, 685 miles away from the reservation. And you know, in America, it's against the law to use high-tech weapons or equipment against its citizens. So the DEA, they don't follow none of their own rules. They just run rampant over people. And uh, I think today, the obstacles they created for us, we need to reverse the tables on them. And if all of us would write to your congressman and tell them 31 states have legalized hemp and marijuana, you should cut the DEA's budget down by 31 states, only allow them 20 states worth. And you know, we gotta fight back. <laughs> as, long as, as long as we don't say nothing, they're gonna continue to have our way with us. And um, you know, I'm not gonna repeat it, you all know that drug war they call it. You know, everything, the war is such a harsh word. Why couldn't they use a gentler word? And when you hear the word war, it makes you kind of get angry, kind of mm -hmm. tense. And so they got to use different gentle language on all that legislation that they pass. The Lakota people, every time we barely get to a point where our treaty is going to go to federal court, the Supreme Court heard it already. And the Supreme Court in 1980 told Congress, you took the land illegally. Make amends to the Sioux. So what did they do? Instead of returning our sacred places, they offered us money, and we turned it down. Today it's a little over a billion dollars, and we're still standing strong. We want our sacred sites back. We don't want money. Money can just burn, and tomorrow you'll be broke, and we'll be in worse conditions. So I, we always spread the word, the Black Hills is not for sale. Dakota Access, you're not wanted in our treaty territory. And I'm Alex Whiteplume, and I prove that message. for president <laughs> okay we got we got a couple minutes for a couple questions if anybody wants to get up here and ask them uh, Alex um, oh. <laughs> did, did the Lakota build a hemp creed structure is that right yeah in 2002 we built the first hemp house in America okay yeah see I, I, I built a hemp creed house and oh. yours was one of the examples we yeah. used so you were an inspiration there for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
They're, yeah. they're beautiful to live in. They're warm and they're cool in the summer and hot in the winter. Thank you. Uh, my name's Sheree Bromley Taylor. I um, would be interested, Michael, maybe we can help Alex. Um, would you be willing to draft that letter? I'd be willing to put it in my business and on my pages to encourage my people to help support your cause. Absolutely. No, thank you for that encouragement. Um, we've got the beginnings of a letter anyway, and so if people are interested, um, I I'll have give a card. You my card. Yeah, absolutely. I welcome any of that. Absolutely. Um, and, then you guys we'll can pick it up off of my to, site to too. That. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Hi there. Um, Sam Johnston. I'm a cannabis attorney. Uh, thank you. Great panel. And Alex, thank you. You're just a superb model and inspiration for all of us. Um, my, my question is, is and I'm, I'm just, I'm not really clear about how the government justifies its conduct in terms of, you know, you say the treaties were abrogated. And, and so I'm, I'm just a little curious about how the mechanism works on that. You mentioned that there was a clause in the treaty about um, you know, turning over the bad people to the government and, you know, so obviously we need, and then that leads to sort of wh where we go from here. We need to enforce the, the, the treaties as they currently exist, or do we need to amend them, maybe renegotiate going forward with a, a more complete vision? Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> Our problem started back in 1828. As you know, the Cherokees became civilized and they had plantations, they even had slaves just to imitate their colonizers. And in 1828, they went to Supreme Court because of Manifest Destiny. They were going to move them all to Indian Territory in Oklahoma. And so they went to the Supreme Court saying, no, we're civilized. We speak white man's language. We, we wrote our alphabet down. We create our language. So the Supreme Court judge, his name was Black, or Marshall, Judge Marshall. Marshall said, um, there's no case law to deliver any sentences on Indians, or uh, at least Lakotas. And so what he did was he looked into the doctrine of discovery that that dirty dog Columbus came here with. And in that dirty dog's document, it says that they're heathen, savages, they're not baptized, and if they're not baptized, kill them. That was a justification to kill all the um, nations from the East Coast, West Coast, and the Gulf. So uh, he took the wording from the doctrine of discovery and then declared us as domestic dependent nations. If you read Article 2 of the U.S. Constitution, Section 2B, it says Indians are sovereign nations excluded from all form of taxation. If you read Article 6 of the U.S. Constitution, it says treaties are supreme law of the land. There's never been one president that's been honorable in the history of this country. They're all dirty, rotten liars and thieves. That's how we're going to be until they keep their word. Eric, do we have time for one more? Yeah. Steve. Sean. Sean. Sorry. Hi, Patrick. Um, Alex, uh, I've known you for years. Um, first of all, my name is Sean Crew. I'm with Hemp Oil Canada. We also are a sovereign nation, Alex. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've mentioned you outside, and I just uh, uh, wanted to offer you again. Next year, when you're ready to cultivate, we're going to supply you with all the seed that you need. Hokkahe, right. hokkahe. Gratis. <laughs> I, I got to let Denny in real quick. Nataki <laughs> Asaho. All my relations. I thank the Great Spirit for association with you, brother. And uh, um, I have one quick question. Uh, where'd you get your seeds that you planted way back when? <laughs> Speaking That's of seeds. a secret that I'm going to go to my uh, great <laughs> spirit with. Thank you, Alex. Be because there's a hundred people claiming my seeds. <laughs> Don't listen to none of them. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Are we all done? Thank you. Great job. Okay. Thank you. I want to say thank you to everybody and uh, for listening to me and treat me real good. I want to say thank you especially to all my friends like Sean and all the old people, Eric and Steve and, and uh, you know you're real healing for me because the burden of carrying this on my shoulders every day sitting at my house waiting for the feds to come up my road to arrest me. I know what drug dealers feel like now and when you guys came amongst me and you helped me take that off my shoulders and vote hemp. If it wasn't for you, this restraining order wouldn't have been lifted. And I want to thank uh, the lawyers, too, who uh, came into Indian country, and all of a sudden they start running into walls of the feds. They had uh, realized how hard it is for Lakota people to exist in this world. So to all uh, the people in the hemp world, 
वो फीला हो कहे And I also have a lifelong friend. I ate a pizza with him one time in California. And so David Bonner, without David Bonner, you know, I use his toothpaste and I use his shampoo and I use his lotion. And so I just appreciate the heck out of David Bonner. And I'm waiting to run across him so I could tell him that in person. Wopila, Dr. Bonner. <laughs> <laughs> 